Cool, so what I want to begin with is this. Some of you have heard this story. For some of you, it might be, might be new. And we're going to go back. The year is, it's like December 28, 2005. Father Mark Mary, before he was Father Mark Mary, is cruising in his Jeep Grand Cherokee coming down Fairmont, Fairmont Avenue in Orange County. <laughs> well, that's fun. Oh. Uh, uh, and I, I'm calling my friend Jared, and what's going on is this, is I'm just going down, and I'm going to go say goodbye to uh, my girlfriend, or who was my girlfriend, and in a couple hours, I'm going to be getting on a plane, I'm going to be flying to Africa, where I'm going to go teach for a year, and then I'm going to be going to, to New York to join the Franciscan Friars of Renewal. And so, I'm telling my buddy, like, hey, Hey, Jared, I'm just really worried. Um, what are we going to call it? I'm worried about Tracy. Um, when I leave, I just don't know like, what's going to happen. And, and Jared's been like my buddy and was always at his house. There was four biological kids, four adopted, a bunch of foster kids, so like huge family. It's like, if you can just look out for Kimmy. Oh, what was her name? Tracy. Kimmy. <laughs> um, we're going to keep working. Oh, it was a rough start. We're gonna keep. We're gonna go back to Tracy. Um, <laughs> shoot. Oh, okay. Anyway. So anyway, I'm like, hey, if you can, if you can look out for inviter, blah blah blah, this and that. So I go down, uh, see her there. You know, make this very kind of epic goodbye. She's crying a bunch. I'm crying like one very slow tear. Um, <laughs> And I get in my car, and she, gets, she gives me like a scrapbook she made. And this is it, because this is like, again, the situation is, like I love this woman, she's beautiful, I, can, I, can, I would love to spend my entire life with her. I'm about 20, 20 years old at the time. But the Lord has just done this thing in me, and I'm gonna be a priest, right? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave and I'm gonna pursue this. And, so, I, and I, so I'm leaving and I'm driving back home, and all of a sudden I just get rocked with this emotion. And I have to pull over. Actually, I pull over into the Mormon parking lot. Um, <laughs> and I just start like bawling and repeating, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Because what's happening is this, is this woman uh, who loved me, right? And who was pretty and who smelled nice um, and who laughed at my jokes, right? Um, she was the best thing that I'd ever experienced in life. But God was inviting me to this other thing in the future. And it's hard, and it's hard. So fast forward the tape, uh, I moved, did the Africa thing, did the Friar thing, obviously. Um, when I got back from Africa, I don't know, boy and girl, I don't remember what names we're using, boy and girl. Um, <laughs> Ended up getting, they were dating when I got back, they ended up getting married. Pretty sweet. Um, and on the scrapbook that she had given me was a picture that we took in front of his like family portrait. And over the family, because of the uniqueness of it, it said, never place a period where God has placed a comma. And it was just so beautiful and so fitting for her that this is what God was doing. And I start with a story because what I'm talking about is the reasonableness of Catholicism. Like, is it made up? Where does it come from? And coming from this place of my own personal experience, that God did something in my life so real and so concrete and so tangible that I was willing to leave behind the best thing that I had ever experienced in life. And and we don't do that for just ideas or fairy tales, but something happened. And that was almost a little bit less than 20 years ago. And the Lord keeps providing, and he provided for them as well in a really beautiful and special way. What I'm gonna do though, what I'm, I feel pretty good about. Um, too late if I don't at this point. Is, is actually I'm gonna talk about the reasonableness of Catholicism. And I'm going to root it and kind of base it in three of the top five most popular podcasts on Spotify in the U.S., right? So the top five pod, uh, podcasts in the U.S. on Spotify. Um, Joe Rogan, armchair expert, some news one, 
crime junkie that like all the women listen to and then they freak out when they're home alone. Let's think about that. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and call her daddy, right? These are the top five. And I realize we're gonna be good about it. Like it's like some like edgy waters. Um, but the reality is that if we look at this population here, and what I'm gonna talk about specifically, armchair, call her daddy, and I'm gonna talk about uh, Joe Rogan. The reality is, although this is a Catholic group, almost for sure, all of these podcasts have been listened to by a majority of the people here, depending on the demographic. And all of them have proposed something or some sort of worldview that, we, that undermines the Catholic and the Christian proposal, and we wanna look at it. So the first one, is Joe Rogan, right? And Joe Rogan, he's popular. And one of the reasons that people like him so much is he's kind of judged to be intellectually honest or in, there like, seems to be some like intellectual integrity. He'll have people on from different sides. He'll ask tough questions. Um, but to be honest, there's like a pretty big blind spot. And I think that he has a pretty big blind spot when it comes to Christianity and Catholicism and he's like pretty solid and asks good, hard questions. But multiple times, he's proposed this book. I think the title of it's something like The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. And he's proposed, and sort of as a valid argument proposal, that Christianity is basically the fruit of somebody doing mushrooms for a bunch of people. Joseph Rogan, come on. Uh, raise the Catholic. Uh, and so here's the thing, right? Part of what this comes with is just this, this sort of worldview, and it's not super on the head. It's like Christianity is kind of ridiculous. It's kind of a fairy tale. It's kind of for foolish people. Um, but also it's kind of like, the, like for like a minority, like you kind of are like kind of weird if you believe in it. And so I'm not even gonna really have a lot of people representing the faith on this platform. Um, but here's the thing, and I'm gonna be quick with this. For the most part, the approach I'm gonna take to this is gonna be Franciscan and not Dominican maybe. Like, it's gonna be from somebody who's like not too good at reading books, you know? Um, <laughs> but the, uh, just kind of, we'll do this real quick. St. Thomas Aquinas, he has these, what he calls the five proofs of God. They're not proofs in the sense that if you read them, you're like guaranteed to believe. That's not how faith works. But they're really solid. And he, I, just, let's, let's just begin. And again, we're gonna go through it quickly. But we, we exist. <laughs> and that's pretty wild. And we've never seen something come out of nothing. And we don't really have a good idea of how that could have happened. The idea of God, of a creator, of a first mover. Like the intelligibility, the design within creation, um, it's like beautiful and it's amazing and it's like how the heck did this happen? And there's a reason until basically the last century, looking at reality and looking at creation and looking at the world, basically everybody believed in something supernatural, something divine. It's kind of a new phenomena to be able to like look at all of this and reason away God. Just like, so it's like, we're gonna, we're gonna keep moving. But to be real again, like that's like a really, really solid argument. Um, number two is this, is just again, like there's a, there's a, a quick proposal and, and, and the hope for this, right, is like not necessarily that you're gonna hear this talk and all of a sudden you're totally gonna believe or not that you don't already believe. But I just wanna have a, like a very kind of quick kind of rundown of like reasons for the reasonability of our faith. So that if a weird kind of argument comes that you can't answer, at least one time in your life you've heard like, oh, actually there's a lot behind this and supporting it to help you kind of navigate when the waters get particularly rocky. Um, so again, if, if the intellectual tradition of the church, if you look back at St. Justin Martyr, you look at the Cappadocian Fathers, you look at St. Augustine, you look at St. Thomas Aquinas a few hundred years later, you look at John Paul II most recently, if we look at each of the centuries for the last 2,000 years, we can make a pretty good case for having like the smartest kid in the room. Um, 
Definitely, like, if there's, like, an AP course, like, there's a heck of a lot of Catholics in there. Like, we can hang with anybody on the intellectual level. Read Thomas Aquinas. It's, like, incredibly thorough, incredibly profound and clear. A little bit boring, but I'm a Franciscan, so I can say that, you know? Um, <laughs> but, but behind us, we have some really clear concrete thinkers, science, evolution, Big Bang, we can hang. We're not worried about that. We have an intellectual tradition that can match anybody, okay? But what I want to say, what I want to move to is this. Oh, we don't need to put that back on. Okay. Is it's, it's, we can make, we can, we can hang with the philosophy and the science and the history and the, the psychology, all that sort of stuff. But also, we have a whole lot of concrete life experiences that also back up what we believe. So I'm gonna talk about kind of the work of God and the work of the evil one real quick and the ways in which these manifestations have happened and are, and are good to work with. Like, there's a question, why don't miracles happen like they happen in the Bible? And my response is, who says they don't? Because we have a whole lot of evidence that miracles continue to happen in abundance today, actually. What are a few of examples? Our Lady of Lourdes, Guadalupe, Padre Pio. Lourdes, Our Lady appears to this young woman, St. Bernadette. She digs a little hole, the water starts to run. Thousands and thousands, millions of people go to Lourdes every year to get healing. And there have been a ton, but there's like 60 confirmed. Why are there 60 confirmed? Why? Because there's so many happening. First of all, because we take it serious. Number two, there's so many happening for it to be investigated it's gonna have to like hit a lot of criteria. So there have been 60-ish, 60, 60 whatever it is, maybe a little bit more, confirmed. Like miracles that have gone through like the scientific blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, sweet. Um, Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared to St. Juan Diego 500 years ago. Her image miraculously imprinted upon the tilma. It's still there, right? And there's no explanation of why this fiber still exists, why this hasn't deteriorated. There's been sort of similar uh, whatever, like materials that have been like, they're gone in like 50 years, 500 years later, it's still there. We can't explain how it was made. It's not like a normal painting. It kind of like rests above the fibers as opposed to how a normal painting does. Uh, somebody's tried to bomb it some, and there was like a spill with like acid and it still survived. And in the wake of it happening, what some eight to 10 million people were baptized at the exact same time basically, that the same number were leaving the church in Europe. Padre Pio, he had the stigmata for a couple decades in the last century where it was investigated, it was looked at, looked at. The proposal was like, we don't really know what happened. He's doing it to himself or he's like, he's thinking so hard about it that this wounds are happening. To which Padre Pio replied like, well, concentrate really hard on being a bull and see if you grow horns. Like, it, that's like, <laughs> It's just, it's just intellectual dishonesty, it's lazy. Um, myself, I was at a, dinner, like a, a brunch at a nice little place, sitting with three women, all very kind of professionals. All three of them had supernatural healings of their back of the spine or an immediate sort of lifting of a tear along uh, postpartum depression. These things are happening. And they, they're happening in my life and they're happening in small ways and they're big ways. But I just wanna take a moment and like sit with it. Because as I even reflect on it and I say these things, it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. And I'm a little bit uncomfortable with like proposing uh, miracles and the supernatural in this way. I think because I've spent so much time and energy like really trying to be very reasonable and rational and not fanatic. And that's kind of my, my shtick. Um, that's why I'm not into like some of the, call them like the indie mystics of some of, some of the brothers are into. Like I don't know what to do with that. Um, And it's good, it's good to wrestle with it. But it's important to just stay before the facts. These things have happened and they're happening across centuries, across regions, and they continue to happen. And there's no explanation why they're happening apart from Jesus is who he says he is. Um, there's another thought about that. Jesus is still who he says he is. Um, I forgot what I was gonna say. All right, but, and, and the second thing is this, 
is with the miracles, sometimes why we dismiss them so quickly is this. We're working with this hypothesis. If the supernatural is happening, if these miracles are true, well, then everybody would believe. And that's just not true, right? Jesus healed 10 lepers and nine left, only one returned. A bunch of people saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, and what was their response? We need to put Jesus to death. Um, Miracles don't just cause faith or belief, even if they can be very, very concrete and really profound. And maybe we'll touch on it later, but because it's, faith isn't just a matter of, it requires an assent of the will, uh, yes. But anyway, so that's like part of why we don't really buy into them, because like, well, if they were true, then everybody would believe, and that's just not really how it works. And now we'll go into something a little bit, um, kind of like spooky, uh, happy Halloween. Um, right, there's a reason that the demonic doesn't manifest very regularly, and I'll just touch on something real quick. I've had a chance for a couple years to live in the friary with a CFR priest who's an exorcist and who does deliverance. And we have to make a rule, Father Glenn, you're not allowed to pray with people when we have guests. Because we had a group of college missionaries from Canada visiting us, and they stay a couple rooms above where Father Glenn does his little Ghostbuster ministries. And... um, (laughs) He's praying with somebody, and the woman starts to manifest with the cursing and the voices and all this sort of stuff, and the missionaries got scared and started to cry, right? It's like, Father Glenn, you're scaring our friends, you know? Um, And again, I had the experience being there. I was on retreat. He starts praying with somebody. She starts going, blasphemy, witchcraft, F this, blah, 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 Um, the voices, all that sort of stuff. He does his, his thing right by the window. Uh, his window's a little bit cracked. Somebody hears the screaming. They call the cops. The cops show up. They can see inside. They knock on the door. He comes out with the stole, like, hey, is everything okay? He's like, yeah, I'm just praying with some people. And he can see in there the man and the woman, and they're like, normal. Um, and so he leaves. The, the police leave. But there's like a, a note in some police book of like, weird stuff happening at the friary. But I say this because it's all very concrete and tangible. And we have a, right, if you go into the, where we have mass, there's a sign like in the, kind of in the bottom that says, like open seating, no flags beyond this point. Why do they have that, that sign there? Because somebody's taken like a flag and waved it there, right? It didn't come out of nowhere. Like the rule sort of suggests something has happened. Um, similarly, it's like, Father Glenn can't pray with people because when he does it, manifestation happens. Like, you don't, these rules and these ways of investigating, all this sort of stuff doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out, it doesn't come out of theories and it doesn't come out of a mushroom trip. It comes out of life experience. And so there's a lot we just want to wrestle with, stay before it. Uh, Number two, what I'm going to go into is this, is um, real quick, armchair expert, right? And this is, I was, here, like, I, I do our podcast, and so it's like just trying to study a little bit how people do things. One of my, one of my loved ones recommended it. And, and here's the thing, I have to be honest with it, is like I don't think sometimes listening to it could be sinful, sometimes probably seriously sinful. Like it's not an appropriate podcast. But, but in this context, the reality is a lot of you listen to it. And so a lot of you are hearing something, and we have to wrestle with it. And what does he propose? The host kind of fundamental proposal about Christianity is it's part of, it's like a part of like the, an, a means of control by the patriarchy and it's a way in which a bunch of pedophiles and perverts get to do what they want to do and cover it up. That's a real proposal that we have to wrestle with. The patriarchy one maybe we can't get into today because it's, it's pretty deep. But we can talk about scandal. We can talk about scandal. Um, does scandal undercut the fundamental Christian proposal, what we believe? And we have to be honest. Have members of the church, priests, bishops, even up to cardinals, done horrendous crimes throughout the last 2,000 years, even in our recent history? Yes. Yes. Are they horrendous? Are they crimes? Yes. Should they be punished? Yes. Should we do everything we can to make sure it doesn't happen again? Absolutely. When I walk and someone says, yells at me, hey, pedophile, which has happened, 
in some ways, do I have to accept it because I understand that my brother priests have really harmed people? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a great evil. Does it undercut what we believe? And, and, I, and I think I just want to wrestle with this, but with a, like a reverence and a sensitivity. Because we can't disregard it. I don't want to be flippant of it, of the scandal, or those who have been hurt by it, or those who have experienced something like that, even in this room. Um, and so just in the name of Jesus and his church, as a priest and representative of Jesus Christ, I apologize. And I'm trying, and I'm trying to be a part of, of, of the answer and the response and to do penance. I'm trying, and I'm sorry. Um, and, and, and perhaps this time here together could be a place where you pray about it, speak to somebody, and start to bring some healing. But still, if we can, what is the Christian proposal? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The second person, the Trinity, became man of the Virgin, was born and came to save us. And I'm going to say no, right? We don't propose Christianity to be magic. To be baptized doesn't mean to be sanctified forever. Like, it takes work. Faith without works is dead. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will be saved, but those who do the will of my Father. The vine has to stay on the branch. If it's removed from the branch, it dies. We understand and propose that, like, hey, a, a belief for one part of time or belief in general or baptism is not enough. You have to participate with grace. And if you don't, it's not going to transform your life. You can be as vile and as ugly as anyone, and perhaps even worse. This is just what the Christian proposed. This, this is what we believe. This is what we propose. Jesus came to save us and offers us an invitation, but it's not magic, and it doesn't happen without a long journey. To explain it real quick, uh, I have a friend named Michelle. Michelle's trying to get fit for 2023. So what she does is she joins a CrossFit gym, January 2023. She's in that CrossFit gym three times a week, getting ripped, eating organic, whatever. February, two times a week. March, one time a week. But she's still wearing the Rogue shirt. She's got the, uh, she's paying her dues. She's got the no bull shoes. Um, she still calls herself a CrossFitter, whatever. April, once a month. May, she's not going anymore. June, she's just not doing anything. She starts hitting up wherever she's hitting up and getting like mocha frappuccino, caramel macchiato with a, a bunch of other little sweets. And she's just like, she's just crushing the chips and the donuts and all that sort of stuff. And we get to whatever it is, we get to November. Still rocking the, the, all the CrossFit gear, still paying her dues, still a registered member. And, that, but, and she goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, like, hey, you just gained like 80 pounds, and you're like, your heart's going to fail. We need to do something about this. And so she tries to sue the CrossFit and says, this thing didn't work. And so she makes her case, well, I was part of this CrossFit thing, and I worked out for a couple months, and I wore the shoes, and I paid the dues, and now my, my health is, is like bad as ever. And the manager's like... Judge, we, we, we never promise that if she just comes for two months and pays her dues, like, it's going to work. It's going to transform her life. Like, you got to keep doing it. Like, what's the judge going to say? It's like, oh, yeah, of course. Like, Michelle is not a CrossFitter, even though she says she's a CrossFitter. Like, she's not cooperating. She's not doing it. And so it's not going to have the effect, right? But we kind of do that with the church. It's like, there's all these people who are, who are wearing the, the, the Christian t-shirt. They might even be wearing the clerics, but they're not actually in relationship with God. They're not fostering and developing the divine life within them. And so what's going to happen? They're going to just get worse, and they're going to sin, and they're going to be a mess, right? And are they still, by baptism, members of the church? Yeah, but we just, again, we don't say it's magic. So if you want to know what CrossFit, if it works, like... Take a look at people who really do it and see what happens. If you want to know if Christianity works, if it's real, if it's concrete, look at the saints, look at Mother Teresa, look at John Paul II, look at St. Therese, look at the missionaries of charity who are all over the world caring for, for orphans, the abandoned, the homeless. Look at my brothers who are taking care of the homeless who are doing all sorts of things. Like If you work it, it transforms your life. If you don't, it doesn't. And this is what we propose. And again, do we need to do the work of rooting out all of the scandal and all of the corruption? 
100%. But, but can we remain in the church as sons and daughters of the church while we do the work without being hypocrites? Yeah, I think 100%. 100%. We have to do that. We have to do that. And number three, I got to cook real quick right here. By cook, I mean go quickly. Um, okay, call her daddy. Okay, relax. Um, <laughs> caveat. So I'm going to approach this as I might talk about uh, Playboy and the effects of the sexual revolution or how we should sort of shut down Pornhub because of the responsibility in, in part in sex trafficking. Like this isn't, the, it is, it is uh, ugly enough and vile enough, like you can't go do research with this to prepare for this talk. So I didn't go and listen to these episodes from what I know about it because I just knew it, it's not appropriate, right? I looked at some of the names of it, got a sense of what it's about. And that's where I'm coming from, okay? I'm Father Mark Mary is not a call her daddy listener, noted on the record, all right. <laughs> um, and none of you can be either, okay. But basically what it is, and, and again, this is probably the second most, most popular, so you know, if it was like a small one, I wouldn't even talk about it because I don't want to put it on your radar. But, but it's a very, very popular one, and again, a lot of you have probably listened to it. Basically, the host is proposing an approach to sexuality, which is like, go for it. All things, like get after it. Everything that we sort of believe about uh, the dignity of the human person and sexuality, it's just like, it's just not that. And so, you can sort of figure it out. Um, again, on the level of psychology, of, under, of philosophy, of understanding the human person, of theology of the body, we, like, everything that we teach about sexuality and sex and the necessity of keeping the unitive and procreative components of, of it united and sex within marriage and all of that, it all is beautiful and true, 100%. But again, we don't just believe this from theory. We're not just a bunch of like sort of old men trying to control people's sexuality. Like, and that's where I'm gonna speak about this. Like the theory and the philosophy and the psychology makes sense and checks out, but so does lived experience. I had a chance to live for a couple of years in Honduras. And at one point I'm, I'm uh, back home flying down to Honduras to kind of whatever it was, to get back to work. And on the plane comes this, this group of like college students on like, a medical mission. And a bunch of them were college soccer players. It's the first time I figured out what Lululemon is. They're all wearing like the same matching, whatever those things, pants. And I'm like, that's, I wonder what that is. Lululemon, I know. Um, this beautiful 22 year old college soccer player, senior, sits right next to me. It's like, hey. She says, hey. And she says, uh, so like, uh, what's this? I said, well, I'm like a, a Franciscan, like a Catholic monk. She says, Oh, um, just so you know, I don't agree with what you, the church teaches about sex before marriage. I'm like, okay, all right, let's go for it. Um, <laughs> but it's like, like, it was like right away, sweet, okay. Um, so, I, so, I'm, so I talk to her, I listen to her, she tells her story, right? And she talks about how, um, you know, she's currently living with her boyfriend. She's known him for three months, he's a professional football player. They just moved in together. And she goes on and on telling her story. And she talks about how um, when she was in college, she, she studied abroad for a semester. And while she was gone, her boyfriend slept with her roommate and broke her heart. And, we, and, we're, and we're going and we're talking about this. And at some point we get back to her current boyfriend. And I say, well, like, do you love him? And she says, quote, I don't know if I'll ever love again. I've been hurt too much. A 22-year-old woman has already given up on love because her heart has been too broken. And yet, she is the first to advocate for the culture and the worldview which allowed this to happen. This kind of like, get after it, do whatever you want, sort of sexuality. Sexuality apart from how it is meant to be the result of that is broken hearts. And it's like, this poor woman, this poor woman still advocates for the very thing which broke her heart. This is the mystery of iniquity and the unreasonableness of sin.
And as a priest and as a pastor, I've come across shattered and broken hearts because of pornography, because of divorce, because of infidelity. We don't come at this and teach what we teach about sexuality because we are a bunch of dudes trying to control, but because I am a father who cares about his sons and daughters. And theory and fact and philosophy and psychology and lived experience say that there is a proper way and means and expression of our sexuality. And if we get it wrong, hearts are broken, souls are lost. My brothers and sisters, there is nothing more reasonable, more supported by lived experience across the board than what we, we as a church believe and teach and proclaim. And so to, to bring it in for a quick landing, if all of this is true, then why do so many people not believe? If you can look at Guadalupe or Lourdes and see all these miracles, why isn't everybody doing it? Probably because they're just meeting a bunch of Christians who are like everybody else. And so the, the concrete evidence in their lives is Christianity doesn't make, doesn't transform anybody, doesn't make people Christ-like. And so why do I need to spend my time and energy looking at and investigating their proposal? Like, there's just a whole lot of evidence that says it doesn't matter. And that's real. And so this is the part that kind of comes to you, right? That the name of, of the conference, the theme of the, the conference is you are called. And you are called, and I'm gonna say that you are called like uh, the woman at the well, right? There's this woman, she goes to the well in the middle of the day because she's kind of an outcast sinner. And Jesus comes and he meets her and he speaks with her. And because of this encounter, because of what he reveals to her, because of how he looks at her and loves her, she comes to believe that he is the Messiah. And so what does she do? She goes back home and she tells people about it. And then the gospel says, and they went and they met Jesus and they no longer believed just because of her testimony, but because they met him, right? So step one, step one, we have to talk to Jesus. We have to talk to Jesus. Allow him to speak into your heart. Uh, allow the encounter with Jesus again, not just to be uh, some stories you've heard, a way of life you've been born into, but I want you to have an encounter with a living God who loves you and cares about you and died for you and who reveals to you that the fullness of the capacity of who you are and the beauty that you have. And this is where faith comes from. And this, these arguments and these, these, these facts and these the sort of, if you will, all of this the, the, that we can kind of pull together, the evidence, the miracles, they're helpful, but you add them all up together, they're not gonna add up to faith. Faith is a gift from God. And so we need to meet Jesus and ask him for the gift of faith. Number two, we have to follow him. We have to allow it to transform our life through a daily discipleship. There's a thousand resources here for you to, to do that. But one meeting with Jesus, one retreat, one powerful confession is not enough. You are called to follow Jesus and to let him transform your life today, tomorrow, the next day, the rest of your life. And then finally, right, we, we bring, we don't just bring this good news to Jesus, we bring, other, we bring others to Jesus. Um, you don't have to try and argue it out. You don't have to try and prove it. Hey, let's try and meet Jesus. Let's ask him for the grace to believe. Let's ask him to reveal uh, in our lives who he really is. Like my brothers and sisters, just in closing, I, I believe everything that the Catholic Church teaches. And I freaking love being Catholic. And I love everything about being Catholic. And not only would I risk my entire life on what I have seen and experienced and believed and touched and felt, I am doing it. I'm doing it. That's what I'm, that's what I'm doing. Come on, look at me. That's what I'm doing. I'm giving everything. And, and the Lord has not been done outdone generosity. Um, I'm trying to anyway, all right. So if, if we can just close, uh, we'll, we'll just kind of close with a blessing and asking for the Lord of the gift uh, of an even deeper faith. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we love you, we trust you, we bless you. Uh, we believe that you are who you say you are. 
We thank you, Lord, for the ways in which you have revealed yourself as truth, the way in which you have revealed yourself uh, as creator, as designer, as miracle worker, as healer, as father of our hearts and of our souls. Lord Jesus, we ask, if we have no faith, we ask for faith. If we have a little faith, we ask for more faith. If we have great faith, we ask for a roaring faith, Jesus. We ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit that we may believe with you and follow you with our entire lives. And that this grace and this work within us may transform the world. And that, Lord, uh, we may be the light and the truth uh, that you desire to be in the world, Jesus. We love you, we bless you, and through the prayers of all the angels and saints, especially St. Francis, St. Clair, and Our Lady of Guadalupe, may Almighty God bless you all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace. Thank you.